Okay. Welcome to personality theory. Uh, this is going to be a series of lecture on personality. Uh, but I'm going to get us started by giving us the building blocks. And that's usually how things go in personality uh, research. So my goal for today is to define what personality is, talk a little bit about where personality theory comes from, introduce you to the eight frameworks by which people view personality theory, and then talk about a concept called the Barnum effect. And by the end of that, I will show you uh, a video by a, a YouTuber uh, who demonstrates the Barnum effect pretty nicely. All right, so what is personality? Well, when we talk about personality, uh, truth is there could be many different definitions of personality, but in general, personality, uh, psychologists are usually answering the question, what makes us unique? or what makes us a human being. Now, truth be told, there is a segment of researchers who study animal personality and there are some interesting findings there, but we're gonna focus on human beings and, and who we are. So when we think of personality psychology, it is the scientific study of the uh, psychological forces that make you unique. So we acknowledge that there are general tendencies. However, each person is unique. And as a function of that, we are always being torn between studying the uniqueness of the individual or comparing that individual relative to general norms. So there are eight aspects of personality, which are linked to the eight theories of personality, which I'm gonna give you a preview uh, of as well in this lesson. So one aspect of personality is the unconscious. Uh, these are the forces that are within us, but are beneath our moment to moment awareness. So there are forces uh, under our level of conscious experience, but these forces impact our decision-making. Uh, so um, if you've ever been in a situation where you acted a certain way and then you look back and you're like, wow, why did I do that? It is possible according to a psychoanalytic perspective that it was something happening beneath the surface that burst through from the unconscious to the conscious. All right. We also talk about ego forces. And in general, the ego is your part of the personality that you're most aware of. It is grounded in reality uh, and it gives you a sense of identity or self. Now, when we talk about the self as a whole, that's a focus on um, your global personality, right? So um, if you have a global personality trait, we wanna see whether you have consistency or inconsistency within it. Now, uh, there's another lens of personality that says, biology plays a role. So whether it be genetics or physical attributes or physiological responses in the brain, hormones or temperament, biology plays an important role in who we are. Now, each aspect of personality oftentimes interacts with another aspect of personality. Early personality theorists would fight um, vigorously for their position and say that my view of personality is correct and yours is wrong. 
However, in a modern world, we acknowledge that most theories actually profit from more than one aspect, even though they claim that theirs is true. Now, then we have behavioral aspect or conditioning. So who we are can be influenced by things like reinforcement, things like shaping, uh, reward and punishment, and so forth. Who we are can be influenced by cognition or how these are our thoughts, right? So our thoughts influence our personality and how we interpret the world. And then we have something called trait theory or specific attributes or inclinations that are unique to us. Now, most trait theories say that each attribute is on a spectrum. There are, there's a range of performance of these abilities. And um, so let's take one, I'll just throw it out there, introversion or extroversion. Well, that's a spectrum, right? That's a spectrum uh, in of itself. So there's a range of uh, normality. And then if you go too far to one extreme or the other, it could be problematic. But we tend to focus in trait theory on uh, norm reference attributes and compare you relative to the norm. Then we talk about uh, spiritual existential models of personality. So finding meaning, purpose, self-fulfillment, happiness, all of these attributes are part of your personality, right? And we all want to be happy. We all want to live a life with meaning or figure out what our purpose in life is. So this spiritual and existential model of personality tries to focus or ponder what our existence is. Um, and then we have the person situation interactionist model. Uh, so far, we have talked more or less what's happening within the person. However, the person is not devoid of the environment. So the environment will dictate in many ways that which is appropriate or inappropriate. So there's a connection between nature and nurture, or intrapersonal and interpersonal attributes or the self in the environment. However you wanna say it, they come together to determine the right behavior. All right, now, obviously, when we talk about these eight aspects of personality, when we understand personality, it's best to take a more holistic approach and try and understand all eight aspects or dimensions to have a fuller picture of personality. Now, the scientific methods that are used in biology, chemistry, and physics are also used in psychological science. So the concept of personality theory, which is a subfield within a larger uh, psychological discipline is required to use the same rigor of all the natural or biological sciences. So uh, scientific methods are used to test all of the personality theories. And we rely on data and statistics to determine whether we have meaningful differences in personality. Now, uh, this is important because that's what makes uh, the scientific study of personality more superior to things like astrology, palm reading, or whatnot. And at the end of this lesson, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about astrology and palm reading and why we are so connected to our astrological sign or a horoscope or palm reading or all of these different things. Now, there are different scientific approaches. You could have a true experimental design. You can have observational studies. You could have correlational research, but the vast majority or the, uh, a very common approach to studying personality is correlations or in a more advanced way, regression analysis, right? So what are correlations? 
correlations look for the relative strength of association between two variables. Now that's just a fancy way of saying how much of an agreement you have between factor A and factor B. If you have perfect match or agreement, you would have a perfect correlation where you would be able to predict 100% of the cases of B if you knew factor A. However, in most cases, correlations are not perfect. So the stronger the correlation, the stronger the association, the more we can predict an outcome from one factor to the other. Now, when we have a correlation, the common scenarios are either a positive or a negative correlation. Now, it is true that it's also positive, possible, pardon me, to have no relationship between the variables. But in general, a positive correlation says um, increases in one factor associated with increases in another factor. So additionally, we could say increases or decreases, right? So decreases in factor A are associated with decreases in factor B. In short, both factors go in the same direction. So height and weight would be an example of a positive correlation. So the taller a person is, the more their weight tends to be on average. The shorter a person is, the less their weight tends to be on average. So both height and weight tend to trend in the same direction. Whereas there's also something called an inverse or negative correlation where as factor A increases, factor B decreases. So the factors are going in opposite directions. So an example in personality might be as introversion increases, the number of dates they have per uh, week, month, year, whatever you want to say, decreases. Now, obviously, the more reserved a person is, which a person who's an introvert tends to be more reserved, it is likely to result in them not asking for numbers and getting dates and things like that. Now, I will say now, and I'll say it again later, being an introvert is not the same thing as being shy. And your textbook tends to mix that up a little bit from time to time. Uh, but an introvert is more uh, where you, how you process information. You tend to process information within oneself. You tend to retreat within oneself to think for decision-making, whatnot, rather than an extrovert who tends to process information external to themselves. People who are introvert tend to be charged or recharged by taking a break or taking a vacation all by themselves, where an extrovert tends to be charged up or recharged by going out with their friends and having a massive party. So, um, but it isn't about shyness, right, necessarily. Uh, there is some link between shyness and introversion, but they're not one in the same. And if you want a great book on, the, on introverts, I encourage you to um, pick up the book Quiet by Susan Cain. All right. So what you're looking at here is an example of a negative correlation. As factor A increases, factor B decreases. So in this graphic, um, we're taking a person or a data set where introversion is increasing from low to high, right? But you'll notice as introversion increases, the number of Facebook friends decreases. So they're going in opposite directions. So Steve scores pretty high on introversion and he has about 100 Facebook friends, whereas Ellie has... Uh, uh, scores pretty low on introversion and has five times the amount of friends, right? So uh, that would be an example of a negative correlation. Now, be careful though, because correlation and causation are not the same thing. So is it the um, introversion that causes Steve to have fewer number of friends? The answer is we don't know. 
right? Because all we know is the two factors are associated, but we don't know the direction of the phenomenon. So here's another example to show that correlation causation are not the same thing. So let's take low self-esteem self and depression. Is it possible for low self-esteem to result in depression? Sure. Is it possible for depression to result in low self-esteem? Sure. So which came first, the low self-esteem or the depression? In reality, that question is a chicken egg phenomenon. We don't know. And it's possible for some, one occurred before the other. And, and for other individuals, it was the opposite. So we don't have directionality. In general, to have a cause, the cause must always come first. The cause must precede the effect. We don't have that here. So that's one of the problems with correlation is uh, we don't have the cause preceding the effect. They're linked. Now, another issue with correlation because we're not manipulating an independent variable and controlling for other factors as we would in an experiment is that there is an infinite number of outside factors that could result in our initial correlation. So low self-esteem and depression are associated. Are there other factors that could theoretically cause low self-esteem and depression? The answer is yes, something like a trauma. A trauma, whether it be physical or psychological, could result in um, low self-esteem and depression. So correlations are helpful. They give us insight as to the general trend of what's going on, but you need an experiment to determine cause and effect. Uh, so they're only helpful to uncover the truth. Now, another thing that I wanna talk to you about is uh, decision-making and logic. So there are different theories that use deductive reasoning and there are different theories that use inductive reasoning. So when we talk about deductive reasoning, we start from general principles and use these general principles, oftentimes called laws or theories or principles, to inform our data collection. So it starts with a theory of personality and that guides our data collection. That's called top down. There's also something called inductive reasoning, referred to as bottom up. Now we start from data and develop theories or laws from that data. So going from data to theory is inductive reasoning, going from theory to data is deductive reasoning. And here is just a, a graphic. So which one is better? Is inductive reasoning or deductive reasoning better? Well, the truth is that's a trap question. Inductive reasoning can lead to theories but those theories could lead to subsequent research and it goes in a circle from theory to data, data back to theory, theory back to data, data back to theory, and it goes in a circle over and over and over. And each one further refines our understanding about whatever we're studying in personality. So we actually need both. And one is not better than the other. Uh, I will tell you two things. The more information we know about a topic, the more likely we are going to rely on deductive reasoning. Um, whereas the less that we know about a topic, the more we're going to rely on inductive reasoning. So that's the first thing. The second thing is in research, many times there's a push to ground our research study in theory. So from a scientific point of view or a research study point of view, uh, if you're in an undergraduate class or a, um, a master's or doctoral thesis, they're gonna want you to ground it in theory. So you're gonna operate with deductive reasoning more often. That doesn't mean that it's better because in the real world, there's a lot of research that starts from data or behavioral characteristics 
and then formulate theories around our observation. So we talked about um, deductive inductive reasoning. Psychology also benefits from related disciplines. So neuroscience uh, guides our understanding of the brain and the brain guides our understanding of personality. And as we will see in a subsequent lecture, we're gonna talk about different brain regions being responsible for different personality attributes. And in fact, our prefrontal cortex is the center for uh, personality as a whole. It's our executive decision center. Now, our levels of aggression might depend on areas like the amygdala. Uh, but when we talk about neuroscience, neuroscience can inform how, why there are personality differences in things like aggression, love, altruism. But it isn't just brain regions, it's chemistry as well, right? So bonding, attachment, love, things of that nature, you're likely going to have a neurotransmitter called dopamine and a hormone called oxytocin release. So it's complicated. So we take ideas from neuroscience and uh, neuroscience or brain science gives us some insight as to why some people behave normally and some people have abnormal personality attributes. Anthropology uh, provides a more cultural lens or sociological lens on a large scale. Um, so uh, we take information from cultures. Now, that which is considered a desirable personality attribute in one culture is not necessarily going to be a desirable attribute in another culture. So uh, cross-cultural research is important to understand whether personality is stable or variable across culture. So uh, we don't have one overarching viewpoint, but I, I said there were these eight lenses, but now I'm gonna tie them to the actual theories um, that uh, we're gonna learn about. So psychoanalytic theory focuses on the unconscious. So according to Freud, which is the primary uh, figure in psychoanalytic theory, he believed that you had hidden subsystems. We'll talk about the id being completely beneath the surface in the unconscious that drives things like uh, sex and aggression. And these factors are important in even non-sexual uh, spheres. Now, many of Freud's followers, whether they be students can, or contemporaries, started to shift away from his, Freud's over-sexualization and then they moved towards understanding the ego or the self, right? So the ego, as I said, is more in touch with reality. The self is your global or your larger sense of who you are. Now, a lot of this comes from Alfred Adler's work on inferiority complexes. And we all have areas of inferiority according to Adler, right? Uh, we all have strengths and weaknesses. An area of inferiority might be an area where we're less competent in. And we should strive towards superiority or another way of saying we should strive towards competence. But inferiority is not a bad thing in of itself. And the inferiority complex is because it's at the extreme and it interferes with day-to-day -day function. Then we have the cognitive point of view. So this how your talks about how your active thoughts influence personality. So many times cognitive theories are linked with social theories or social psychology, such as Albert Bandura and the Bobo Dahl study. So how we think influences who we are as well. And then we talked about bio, biological forces. So uh, things like heredity and the role of heredity on personality. Uh, there's the famous Minnesota twins study uh, where twins even separated at birth had uncanny similarity between one another. 
Um, now, nice thing, biology can be linked to other approaches. Uh, it emphasizes things like temperament. And of course, if, since I'm giving names for a lot of these, uh, the biological point of view was influenced by Charles Darwin. Now, Charles Darwin talked about evolution and the human species being on a continuum, right? Uh, what I will tell you though, is that in addition to writing about origin of species, which focuses on uh, biological heredity, there is a other work on the descent of man, which talks about our uh, personality attributes, emotional factors, and how that too uh, could be driven by evolution. From a behavioral point of view, we look at uh, your environment or stimuli and how that uh, results in a behavioral response. So SR learning, stimulus response learning um, is a strong emphasis of behaviorists. So people like Skinner believe that through operant conditioning, I could shape your personality and make you whoever I want you to be. Uh, now we talked about trait theory, looking at individual assessment at, um, techniques to measure personality. People like Gordon Alpert, Costa McRae um, are common names here. So we talk about the big five or the five major factors of personality, things like openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. These are the big five. One cool thing about the big five is that it has cross-cultural validity. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in another lecture. Then we have the humanistic and existential models, which talks about the spiritual nature. So uh, goals like free will, self-fulfillment, uh, aspects within human being. This is the one um, model that puts a very strong emphasis on free will and reaching one's potential, uh, or I shouldn't say it's not the one, it's, but it is, uh, it's one of its hallmarks. So people like Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow uh, are the major players there. And then we talk about person situation interactionist theory, which suggests that we actually have multiple um, behavioral patterns depending on the environment. So we have different selves in different environments. So um, we will get through all of this. We're gonna go through the different models and it's kind of fun if you ask me. Uh, but now I'd like to uh, try and go back to all these theories and ask the question, can we separate the personality aspects, right? The answer is no. And even those theorists of yesteryear who believed that they were only using their own model, most of them profited from two or more lenses of personality. So whether it be Freud who linked biology and psychoanalysis or whether it be Skinner who linked behaviorism and the environment, uh, we're profiting from two or more. And as I said earlier, each of the eight models or theories has something to offer. And if you wanna have a full picture of personality, we should know all of them. So now I'm gonna go through a brief history of personality theory. And when I say brief, that means I'm gonna skip and just give you highlights. I'm not gonna do a deep dive, but um, here's a timeline that you can find in your book on the field of personality theory. Um, but let's go back to ancient Greece. You're like, hey, wait a minute. I thought you were gonna be brief. I will, I promise you. Uh, so uh, Theophastus, which was a student of Aristotle, was one of the early Greek philosophers who tried to understand personality, right? So he would give bi biographical sketches of personality and try and use these as a framework. And um, now each theorist has their own view of 
how many different personality types we have, but uh, he's one of the early uh, individuals uh, in this space. Now, the Greeks and the Romans, uh, when we go to the theater, they would wear a mask. And when we think of masks, we think of Halloween mask or a masquerade party where you wear the mask to hide who you are. But in the theater, the mask wasn't meant to hide who you are. It was meant to typify or to define your character. Right, so Greeks and Romans, and even in um, Latin spaces, the mask isn't meant to hide the character, but it's meant to make up that character. All right, now Shakespeare is another one. All the world stage, men and women are actors, right? So how we present ourselves, uh, we might act one way in a certain context and behave differently in another context. Luigi Perandelli said, Dello said we can step out of the roles that we play so we can shift gear, so to speak. Um, and then obviously uh, there are other philosophers who said we are the masks we portray. There's nothing beyond the mask. Now in religion, religion is another uh, source of understanding personality. So if you go into the Bible, it will describe different individuals and their personality. So if we were to take someone like Abraham, right? Abraham, if you read the book of Genesis, there's an emphasis on his uh, charitable and compassionate nature. His tent was open on all sides and he was hospitable to all who was around him, right? Uh, Reuben, Reuben or Ruvain in Hebrew, it's Ruvain, right? Uh, he, he was the firstborn of Jacob, right? And he was described as uh, more of a zealot and impulsive, and he acted impulsively. Moses was described as being a, a humble servant, right? Humility was his personality trait that they emphasize. And we could go on and on and on in the Bible and see that there was some kind of spotlight on personality, even in the Bible. Now, in Western religions, there's a focus on the primal nature and con um, conflict between our primal nature and temptation and morality. So this might explain some of what Freud said about the id ego, superego, that there is this constant battle between good and evil. Um, and our job is to transcend uh, the uh, temptation, so to speak, right? So that's a Western uh, religion philosophy. Whereas Eastern religions don't focus on transcendence, they tend to focus more on eminence, which is to bring God into this world, make your body a temple and bring uh, conscious awareness to um, righteousness, humility and fulfillment, right? So instead of working towards an afterlife and the battle of good and evil, it's more about higher states of self-awareness and reaching one's potential. So sure enough, uh, when we talk about personality, things like mindfulness will come up. Conscious state oh, expansion will come up. And each of these uh, uh, religions influence the humanistic and ex existential models that follow. Now, um, how we understand religion and human nature or the con conception, it kind of breaks down around the Renaissance um, and then it deteriorates. Now, in early psychology, before I moved to Darwin, in early psychology, religious studies were part of psychology. In fact, if we look at William James, he was one of the early psychologists and philosophers, and he wrote a book, The Varieties of Religious Experience. However, as behaviorism took hold, 
it kind of removed religion spirituality out of understanding personality. And that only comes back in the 1960s, but I'll talk more about that another time. So we jumped all the way from the Bible and Greek philosophy to evolutionary biology. So now I'm moving to the 1800s. So the greatest influence is Charles Darwin. Now Charles Darwin was not the first person who had a theory of evolution. However, he's considered the primary influence or the originator of the theory of evolution or the father better yet, not the originator, the father of the theory of evolution because he collected the data and marketed it, right? So according to Darwin, individual characteristics evolve. And the characteristics that we have today somehow had to have some survival purpose because when there is a mutation and it's not helpful, that will result in extinction of a species. So these genes are passed down from offspring to offspring and that will promote uh, certain characteristics. Now, notice how it's not divine in nature. Your personality is not infused by the soul, but more it's based on your genes. So from Darwin's point of view, he kind of separated personality theory from divine origins. And as I said earlier, even though we're focused on human personality, there are personality attributes in animals as well. Moving forward into the 1900s, early 1900s, there was, well, I should say late 1800s, early 1900s, there was a boom in psychological testing. So Yerke's Army Alpha and Beta test was an early test of personality to determine uh, wh who was suitable in the war effort of World War I. Lewis Terman used uh, intelligence testing um, as a way of determining which immigrant should be admitted to the country, which shouldn't. Now, interesting, there was tremendous bias here. And when we get to the cognitive roots, I'll talk more about that. But sure enough, the Northern European immigrants tended to do the best. Well, there were fewer linguistic barriers that way, the culture was more similar. Uh, but uh, a lot of people were deemed to be um, inadmissible to society based on Terman and his test on Alice Island. And then Guilford actually is one of the major players who starts to quantify uh, personality measures in a meaningful statistical way. All right, then we have Gordon Alpert, which you'll hear all about in trait theory and interactionist theory. He starts to um, define personality as more of an interaction between what's happening within the individual, those psychophysical systems and how they respond or adjust to the environment. So now he's looking at the wholeness of an individual, no longer trying to break you down into parts or elements. Uh, and him, he, like William James, who said you study the whole stream of consciousness said, we don't look at elements. Now, we also have Kurt Levine, uh, who came out of the more gestalt uh, perspective, who said the whole, the whole you is greater than the sum of its parts. Now, it's interesting that this view, you could say uh, that Levine, you could say Alpert, you could even say Adler, who took a holistic approach, all tried to understand personality in a more full or uh, unified sense. So instead of trying to look at elements of personality, study the whole person. Henry Murray, he did a uh, study of personality and he has the psychogenic needs. Um, he did uh, lo longitudinal research and uh, personality where he wanted to study all the aspects of who you are. Each of these figures tried to study the whole person. Now, then we have Skinner and Hull, which were behaviorists. 
They said the whole person approach should be thrown away and behaviorism should be the focus of personality. So they didn't want to study consciousness anymore. They didn't want to try and study a whole person. They just wanted to study environmental triggers and behavioral responses. Now, from a cross-cultural point of view, people like Margaret Mead are important. Now, Margaret Mead is actually not a psychologist. She's an anthropologist who said trying to understand who we are is important to study cross-cultural comparisons. And one of her famous pieces was about the Samoan people and how our view of adolescence in America is very different than the Samoan people uh, in adolescence. And where uh, oftentimes teenage years are described as a storm and stress, like people like G.S. Hall, uh, Margaret Mead said in Samoa, it's not that way. It's a time of incredible happiness and joy. Uh, it's one of the more peaceful times. So trying to understand who we are, we need to make sure that what we're saying matches across culture, or we frame our understanding within a given culture. Another benefit of Margaret Mead is that she really challenged some of the male superiority myths or myths about men and women. So we talked about the unconscious, things that are happening beneath the surface. We talked about the self, which is who, who am I? Now, here is a, a part that I didn't explain yet. I talked about trait theory, trying to look for group norms. Well, many times trait theory operates based on what's called a nomothetic approach. So looking for norms, looking for universal laws or general trends, and then we put the individual within that norm or where they fit within that norm. Other personality theorists, people like Adler, felt that putting people into norms was kind of foolish because there is this subjective reality. And uh, an ideographic approach, which looks at the uniqueness of the individual, that approach would be better. So that's one thing. Now, also, we have to talk about, are there differences between men and women? So these are common, common debates. Uh, the answer is obviously yes. And where do they come from? The answer is both within and external to the person. Right, so there are personal influences which create consistency within the individual and situational factors which um, the environment can alter your behavior. And then obviously across people, some people are more consistent in their behavior, other people are less consistent in their behavior. Now, nature versus nurture, is personality inborn or is it influenced by our environment? Uh, the answer is a combination of the two. So Walt Whitman argued personality was innate. Other people said it's linked to the environment. Who we are today is that who we are gonna be in 30 years. So this is a debate of stability versus change. In general, we believe uh, personality is stable. However, certain aspects of personality are more changeable than others. So individual elements of personality are more variable than personality as a whole. Now, is personality a useful co uh, concept? Well, you might argue why bother study personality because people are complex, right? So it doesn't matter. Uh, so the answer I would tell you is that just because there are is a dynamic factors at play and each person's unique, doesn't mean we should throw everything out. We can find general trends even with the complexity of individuals. Now, personality types and trying to understand the individuals. In the 30s and 40s, we focus on the authoritarian type or the domineering type, the macho man type. And in Nazi Germany, they were looking at the anti-type, which is the opposite of the authoritarian or dominant, the very weak type. Uh, today, uh, psychology has largely formulated theories of personality based on Western cultures. 
And we need to do a better job at looking at Asian, African, Latin and Native American cultures because they shed light into uh, variability across culture. Uh, now, the last thing I wanna to talk to you about is the Zodiac, right? So there are a lot of people who believe in the Zodiac, they spend a fortune in the Zodiac uh, and they wanna know, well, what is my horoscope today? Uh, and there are psychological researchers who study the Zodiac and have determined that the Zodiac actually operates based on something called Barnum effects, which are general statements that are vague enough and uh, hedged enough that it could fit anyone's personality, right? So what I'm gonna do before I finish today's lesson is I'm gonna stop this share and I'm gonna pull up a YouTube video from um, Neurotransmissions, which is uh, basically on this topic. So I wanna share uh, this 10 minute video or so, just to give you a flavor of what I mean by Barnum statements and how we tend to be, um, we're likely to buy into them, uh, even though they're not us. So it's a cool study he does and I thought it'd be a nice way to end the class. So let me put in here, let's full screen that, and I'm gonna start us off. Today, I gave out free personality tests to anybody who wanted them. Hey, you wanna take a free personality test? Folks that took part in it just love it. This is pretty spot on. Yeah, I say it's pretty, it seems pretty accurate. But here's the thing. I love that. The results weren't real. Let me explain. So I've been thinking about manipulation and disinformation and pseudoscience a lot lately. It sure seems like there's been more of it than ever these days thanks to the internet. You've got Gwyneth Paltrow shilling her goop products, astrology seems to be making a comeback in popularity, and somehow psychics continue to stay in business? Which I really cannot comprehend. Like, do they just not have any overhead? Are they living out of their houses and doing work from the, I, I don't know. Anyway, I often find myself wondering, how is it that people fall for this stuff? And I don't mean reading your horoscope every once in a while and thinking it's cute. I mean, really thinking it's legit. How you doing? Does it take a certain kind of person? Are those folks just more gullible? Could you, my intelligent, scientifically inclined subscriber, be susceptible? I needed to find out. So I went to the beach. No swimming today, though. Just free personality tests. Any interest in a free personality test? We're good. Could I offer you a free personality test? All right. Hi, how you doing? Any interest in a free personality test today? Oh, we've been doing that all day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you guys want a personality test? It's free. I've been on it. Awesome. Yeah, come on up. What All right. Is it based on? Here's what I did. Everyone that agreed to participate received the Big Five Personality Test. It's sometimes also called the Ocean Personality Test, which is an acronym for the five parts of your personality that the test evaluates. Openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. You're going to evaluate me, right? Sure am. The participants are all taking an actual version of the personality test, which is a 50-question inventory. Each box contains a statement about a behavior or a personality trait, and you have to rate the statement from one to five where one means disagree and five means agree. And I'm actually scoring these things too to get the results. After that, I hand each participant a summary of their personality based on their scores. So it's yours. I see you not share results with each other yet. Please just read through them. And they get to read the results. So this, these are your results. Go ahead and read them over, and then once you finish, I'm gonna ask you a few questions. <laughs> so far, I'm spot on. That's pretty good, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. We were just talking. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but what they don't know is, I've given them all the same results. One of them is like, oh my gosh, that was like taking a peek into me. Every single person has the same summary. Seems like <laughs> All right. None of the statements on that page have any connection to their answers. On a scale from one to ten, how accurate is the personality summary of you? Oh, it's spot on. Ten. Ten. 
probably seven and a half or eight. Okay. I'm going to say nine. Let's say eight. Eight. Let's say ten. ten. Yeah. <laughs> Freaky, right? This is a psychological phenomenon known as the Barnum effect. The name comes from the greatest showman himself, P.T. Barnum. It said that during his shows, he could tell you everything about a person's character just by looking at him. But of course, he wasn't peering into the souls of audience members and seeing their true nature. Now, this was just a circus trick. See, he was using Barnum statements, which are vague descriptions that can apply to pretty much anyone. Like, for example, at times you enjoy going out with friends, but sometimes you like to stay home and relax. Or while you have some personality weaknesses, you are generally able to compensate for them. Or if you are watching this video, you probably are not subscribed to the channel. Well, that one's just a joke, but well, I guess it's also not, not really a joke. I looked at the statistics and almost 90% of y'all watching are not subscribed. So if you enjoy the stuff that I do here, please consider subscribing. It helps us a ton and you don't have to rely on the algorithm to show you all of our videos. And to all you who are subscribed, you're the best. So this is what I did. I put a bunch of Barnum statements on the page that are really vague and that use hedging language like sometimes or occasionally or you tend to. Now, most of the statements I used came from the now classic 1948 experiment by psychologist Bertram Forer, in which he did pretty much the exact same thing with his psychology students. The only difference is that I removed items that dealt with sex or that overtly stated negative personality traits and added in a few more of my own. Why? Well, other psychologists have replicated the study and have found that people rate the results as more accurate if there's a greater ratio of positive to negative attributes. That kind of makes sense. I mean, you're more likely to agree with something if there's nothing disagreeable. After that, I just put a cute little word that summarizes a statement ahead of each one in order to make it seem a little bit more official. And voila, it's ready to go. So why does this work? Well, the statements are general enough that your brain tries to interpret them to fit your perception of yourself. And as a result, they seem way more meaningful and personal than they actually are. That's why horoscopes can seem eerily specific, and yet researchers have shown that people will rate their horoscopes as highly accurate, even though the researchers simply relabeled the horoscope from a different zodiac sign. And the strange thing is that this effect is universal. It doesn't matter where you live or what gender you are or how intelligent you may be, Barnum effect could work on you. And in fact, I guess it already has. See, it's not just used by astrologers, palm readers, and daytime TV psychic John Edward. Advertisers and salespeople have exploited the Barnum effect to make you believe that you're the kind of person who would buy this product. Politicians give speeches with broad statements like, I represent hardworking people like you, in order to make you feel like they understand your struggles. I'm sure you've taken a few quote unquote personality tests online that tell you why you struggle to keep a relationship or which Harry Potter character you are. And perhaps you've even dabbled in a multi-level marketing scheme because one of your friends from high school could see with certainty that you're just waiting for an opportunity to prove your potential and be your own boss. This may seem innocuous until you realize that the salesperson conned you into buying expensive knockoff knives. The politician didn't really care about the same things as you from the start. The information that you gave online is being scraped by a tech company that could be used to make a profile of you and sold to the highest bidder. And your so-called friend got you stuck in a pyramid scheme hawking essential oils. It's not always so innocent. So how do you protect yourself? Well, you get out your roll of aluminum foil and you make a little hat like this that you can use to protect your brain. That was a joke. Please do not do that. It turns out there are some ways to make you less vulnerable to the Barnum effect, as well as some factors that may make you more susceptible. For example, there's some evidence that people who have experienced hardship during childhood and adolescence may be more prone to the Barnum effect. I was thinking about this in regards to the recent popularity of astrology among millennials and Gen Zers. And you know what happened while those kids were growing up? The financial crisis. Now, I have no evidence to back this up, but I do think that it's kind of an interesting correlation. In terms of how not to fall victim to your mind's natural tendencies, a healthy dose of skepticism with a side of awareness are your best bet. The Barnum effect relies on people taking things at face value, but if you dig a little deeper, look for evidence and question the intentions of the person giving you information, you may find that not everything lines up. Likewise, now that you know about them, keep an eye out for Barnum statements and understand the facts. 
notice when things could apply to pretty much everybody and realize that fortune cookies are mass produced and therefore maybe it's not for telling your destiny. Just ask questions. That's actually the main difference that I saw among participants. Of everybody that took the test, the folks that scored the test as having the lowest accuracy asked the most questions and seemed the most skeptical. Can we read through it and then you ask us some questions? Yeah. Yeah. How many uh, different buckets are like there? Five, five categories yeah. and then and from then zero, zero to five. Exactly. I think it's really hard to categorize people. Yeah. But I mean, overall, like, I don't have like, I don't look at one of these and say, no, that's totally wrong. Yeah, yeah. So I would say maybe like, uh, 6.5 or a 7. I was starting to wonder if these were the exact same and you gave everybody the same results. Well, it's funny you say that because, in fact, that's what happened. Wait a minute. Do we have IRB approval to do this? <laughs> exactly. So what about everybody else? Well, let's just say that they were pretty surprised. What if I told you that all three of you have the exact same results right now? What? <laughs> results giving to everybody. Oh. <laughs> ah, that's a what if I told you that the results that you received are the same ones that I've been giving to everybody else? <laughs> that's, that is really funny. They don't apply to you at all. They have nothing to do with your scores. So I like horoscopes. I like horoscopes, exactly. <laughs> the numbers are not real. Not real. real. Okay, okay. No. Everything is... Uh, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> well, I appreciate you participating. I have no problems with self-esteem. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank All right, you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Good day. Thanks for watching. Until next time. Uh, yeah. So that, in a nutshell, gives you a flavor of what the Barnum effect is all about. I can get you to believe a lot of things that aren't true about you as long as I say them in a very subjective way. Um, I have spent uh, money on palm readings just to debunk the palm reader. And I would feed them intentionally misinformation to see if they would catch it. And they don't. They never do. And I, you know, it's sort of my own parlor trick when I'm with my friends. Oh, let's get a palm reading. And I, my friends know who I am. And I can demonstrate that this person really doesn't know what they're doing. Uh, and a lot of the money that they're getting paid is unfortunate because they're taking advantage of your suggestibility. So when you read your next horoscope, when you do your next palm reading or, or tarot card reading, what I'm gonna tell you is listen to the interpretation and ask questions. And with that, that's our first lesson. I hope you enjoyed, and we're gonna keep moving this train along. Take care, everybody.